historically, there have been two types of luxury electric car. Those designed for drivers. Those designed for passengers. But this car, the Genesis G80 Electrified, doesn't seem to fit into either category. Is this car in a class of its own? We think it might be. This is a very brown car. It is. I feel like they discovered that they could make brown leather and brown plastic and they had some really brown wood and they were like, oh, we must make it all brown. But we should give Genesis kudos for recycling the wood. Yes, the wood comes from furniture manufacturing, which is really good. And um, you know, this, this car has very adjustable seats. You, you commented earlier that the driver's seat has adjustable wings. Yes, you can not just adjust your lumbar support up, down, in and out. You can also adjust the kind of bolsters on each side. I, I think wings is more appropriate. Okay, wings. You yeah. can adjust your wings, which means if you are a larger person or a smaller person, you will be gripped firmly by the seat. Yes, which, which was quite nice. It is quite nice, although you'd think that would be more useful for more spirited driving. And Well, yes, but at the end of the day, all that anybody wants is to be held. That's true. That's true. The seats themselves, though, are a little bit on the firm side, I think. Yeah, you mentioned that to me when you brought the car up to me, which I, you know, we normally try not to share too much beforehand. And I got in and I was like, hmm, they're quite hard. But actually, when I've been driving it a bit more, I found them to be OK. They're just a little firm for me. I think part of that is the fact that this car's only got like 6,300 miles on it and the seats are made with very premium leather. And I feel that maybe the leather hasn't kind of settled in yet. This is definitely not a vegetarian's car. No, no. Or indeed a vegan's car. It's leather every... There's, there's a lot of cow yes, in this car. There's probably several entire cows in this and car. And, you know, there's a lot of suede as well. Yes, but it's not. It's microfiber made from recycled pets. You mean recycled bottles, right? Oh, yes. Because uh, recycled, recycled pets, pets would be... Bottles. Not bottles made of pets. No. No, is that unclear? Polyethylene tetrachloride. That's better. So, it, you know, Genesis did work quite hard to make sure that some of the interior was sustainable. But the rest of this car's fit and finish as a passenger and as a driver is very pleasant. And... You know, there's no orb which I think goes toward the, the, the market decision of having a vehicle that doesn't have unnecessary technology in. And the orb of the GV60 is definitely unnecessary technology. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that would be a turn off to many buyers for this particular market segment. I'm surprised they've actually got a rotary gear selector, which is basically the same rotary gear selector that you have in your Kia e-Nero. It's just been made fancier and it's got uh, 
internal lighting. Yes, they blinged it up a little. They blinged it up a little with a little of Gangnam style, but kind of OAP Gangnam style. Yes, yeah, the the purple glow is an interesting choice for which, this vehicle. But. Which, you know, goes with the whole kind of um, brown interior. One thing that I did notice is, unlike the GV60, which had that rather nifty little drawer, this is an old school glove box. Again, it's it's not changing things that don't need to be changed, but making things comfortable and approachable. And you've got buttons that you can even set up a, a hot function here for the, the star, your favorite button. And it allows you, I think, to have that very kind of predictable experience as a, as a driver. There's nothing internally about the way that the infotainment system operates or the way that the buttons operate that I think would catch anybody out. All of the climate controls are self-explanatory, although they are on a touchscreen. They are on a touchscreen, which is probably my least favourite thing. I do dislike touchscreen climate controls, but they're really clearly laid out. They're very easy to access and they're displayed all the time. Unlike the Hyundai, where it sometimes switches and the Kia also, I think, sometimes yeah. switches. This, it, that screen is just climate control and that is all it displays. And it's a rotary dial for the temperature, which again, very predictable. We should talk about that floating dash though. I don't see it. So I, I don't have a dominant eye um, and I have to actually have prismatic lenses to kind of force both of my uh, different eyes to work together to see stereoscopically. But it means that I struggle to see things like holograms and, and other stereoscopic effects. I can't see a floating hologram as much as some of the other team can. So tell us about how that feels. Most of the time it actually feels okay. I mean, it, it's kind of a gimmick, but it also, I guess, adds that comforting feel that if you are used to a gas car with analog gauges and you step into this, then it does feel more like an analog gauge. The big problem that we've had is that sometimes it gets glitchy and that means that usually for me it's been the speedometer kind of shakes and shimmies slightly on the left in a really quite unnerving way it's not something that you want from your dashboard and it really made it kind of distracting but you can turn it off you can set it back to a much clearer brighter just flat display which is basically exactly the same it just doesn't have that 3d effect so we're on a roundabout which is rare in america so let's try the turning circle because that's something that impressed me about this car is it's actually pretty nimble at turning around which given its length is quite surprising well, given its length and the fact it doesn't have four-wheel steering, it has none of those kind of fancy tricks up its sleeve, apart from the predictive suspension. And you were raving more about that predictive suspension than I think I did. I couldn't really detect it making a huge difference. You said that you felt it change when it was detecting differences in the road. Yes, it definitely was, I think, softening the suspension slightly for larger potholes, which is what it's meant to do. The challenge was that it definitely got a little bit antsy when the roads got really rough. But when there's a little bit of occasional roughness, it soaks it up, I think, better than expected. Less so in town. In town, it actually felt harsh, almost to the point of being crashy at some points. See, I had the I had the experience of, I, I live up in the in the foothills and that means I've got a kind of a twisty mountain road back to my house. And Michael, our cameraman said to me, when you drive it down this road, he was the first person to drive it, said, try out, there's one corner in which the road kind of bumps mid corner. It's kind of, you go down and you turn right and it bumps in the middle of that turn. It throws off a lot of cars. Some cars just kind of, brush it to, to one side. The Mini was a good example of a car mm. that just went, yeah, whatever. But this, it upset this car so much, it was just not feeling at all planted for a 
a few seconds after uh, it, it went through that. I can believe that. I think that ties in with it trying to soften the ride to allow you to have a smoother feel despite not having air suspension, despite not having any real adaptive system to make that happen. It's just got the one trick up its sleeve to try and improve the ride. And, oh yes, you can feel it. And you feel that extra weight in a corner. And I think this again proves this is a car that was not designed to be an electric vehicle. It's a car that was retrofitted to be an electric vehicle. You felt it in that corner, that extra body roll that comes from the chassis. You can feel the chassis and the suspension working hard to try and keep the car glued, but you can also feel that this is not happy about it. No, and I think to an extent, we have to consider who this car is for and whether they are going to be driving it vigorously. And I am not suggesting that all people who are older do not drive vigorously. No, in fact, my, my father-in-law is, is a very vigorous driver and he's in his 80s. Yes. He also has a Corvette. Yes, and I, so. I was talking to one of my friends yesterday and she was chatting about how her father does speed races on a 200 mile an hour motorbike. So... Yeah, I am not suggesting that, but the question of who this vehicle is for comes up and it is for people who probably are not going to be pushing it. They're not going to be trying to dial in the perfect line on a corner and make that apex exactly the way they want to. They're gonna be shuttling their grandkids to a nice park for the day. This feels like a car that it's not for someone who works. It's someone who is retired or is retiring. You will go a long way in this car if you have to, but it's unlikely that you will. It's kind of, you may road trip in it, but you would only road trip and have enough, you know, one suitcase per person. You're not gonna carry a huge amount of stuff in the back. You may put your Christmas presents in the back and go and see the grandkids. Yeah, yeah. A couple of states over. Yeah, I think that's a fair representation, which is interesting because it is actually reasonably long-legged, not enormously so, and it does have that very good rapid charging. But my bum is already asleep. and We've only driven 20 miles. Yeah, and you don't get a massage seat. That's just for me. There's a lot of family similarities between this and the rest of the Hyundai Kia Genesis EVs. You've got the same camera in the mirror that comes up on the dash when you signal left or right. It's got the same operating system. And that means it's also got the same lane keep assist and level two autonomous functions. I don't own a Hyundai Kia vehicle, but you own two. So I'm gonna hand this over to you for, for your opinion of how this car measures up. I think like pretty much all of the recent Hyundai Kia vehicles, and IKEA Genesis vehicles, this falls squarely into the competent camp. You have to remember that this one has HDA, Highway Driver Assistance, not HDA2, which is their super fancy one that does lane changes for you and does more speed sign recognition. I this... was very surprised about that because I expected it being a higher end vehicle to have it. And when I had HDA activated and I went to change lanes, I was like, wait, the car's not going to help me? No, and I'm not sure if that's just a factor of the chip shortage, because I know that was cut from the Ionic 5. It went back to being just HDA, not HDA2. And I don't know whether this vehicle has that capability intended to go in, or whether it's just going to be sat at HDA. Um, obviously, if you buy one and it doesn't have the chips in, it's going to be sat at HDA. It works. It works very well. It doesn't track you terribly carefully which is interesting for an assistant system that requires you to hold the steering wheel. I went a full 20 seconds of not touching the steering wheel before it noticed on the motorway and started saying hey hey you should you should provide some steering input. When I was using it I noticed that it told me when I wasn't looking ahead and it took a while before it realized I wasn't looking ahead so it's obviously got some lane eye tracking but 
it also has this driver attention timer that you can set it to display on the dash that ticks down from when the car was last turned on and it tells you how alert you're likely to be. And again, I think this feature is designed for someone who may not necessarily want to use all of the advanced autonomous assistance features, but instead just wants to be reminded when it's time to stop and have a break. The thing is you can reset that while you're driving, which I thought was a bit weird. Well, there are definitely a few things about the system which are a little bit odd. Like you can access the driver's manual and read sections of it, should you wish to, while you're driving, assuming that you don't end up driving off the road and into a tree. But you cannot store a seat setting while you're driving. Well, I mean, that's fairly standard, not being able to store a seat setting, but I, the, 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 the manual, yeah, that's a, bit, that's a bit different for sure. Yeah, it's just the, uh, I can adjust my seat, but I can't set it. But no, you can read a book. Go, go ahead, have a nice time. So it seems an unusual thing, and there's a couple of things where the system does that. It allows you to access things that maybe shouldn't be accessing while you're driving, and then it lets you not access things that you might want to. As a passenger in this car, I acknowledge this is not a high-tech vehicle. It's not necessarily one that I'm going to want to have a lot of screens in front of me, and it's maybe one that I might want to be listening to some music in. And as a classically trained musician, I was very eager to test out the sound system in this car because it's a high-end premium car. I wanted to have a high-end premium sound system. Well, they have a whole section about how delightful their sound system is and how premium it is in their uh, technical specifications tome. However, I can't help but be disappointed by the lack of audio clarity that the system provided. It's definitely above entry level audio, but there was none of the immersive sound experience that I would expect in a car that's $80,000. To give it a good example, my pickup truck was about the same price as this car, and the sound system in my pickup truck is orders of magnitude more immersive than this. It's got a better representation of, of the highs and the lows. You can hear the clarity of the treble end. You can hear the, the rumble of the bass far more clearly than you could in this car. And I checked and the bass in this car was turned up and it didn't feel like it was. Now I listened to a couple of different pieces of music. I listened to uh, some Galantis. So I listened to some, uh, some, some EDM not necessarily what you would expect to listen to in this car. But I also listened to uh, Peter Herford playing the J.S. Bach uh, reconstructed organ concertos, one of my favourite pieces of music of all time. In fact, it's a piece of music that I have been listening to since I was six and my late aunt gave me a copy on cassette for Christmas in 1985. And so I've been listening to this piece of music for nearly 40 years and I know it inside and out. And I've got to say, I was disappointed at the audio representation. Now there's a digital sound setting in this that allows you to recreate kind of an auditorium experience to make you feel like you're in the middle of the music. It wasn't as, an, as encompassing as I would have liked it to have been. No, and it is interesting that I think much of the sound systems that they've installed in other vehicles are Bose based and this is not a Bose system so I don't know how much of their technology there is their own work and how much support they had in building this but it also might just be that this is really an older vehicle it's a third generation of its platform and maybe you're just kind of experiencing the fact that technology has moved on Okay, so there is something I do want to talk about, Kate, and that is the wine that this car makes. It is, it's like a cat stuck under the bonnet, and it only happens below 25 miles an hour. It, it's the mandatory noisemaker. It's 
unlike a lot of vehicles that have sculpted sounds, you know, BMW employ various composers to create soundscapes for their vehicles. Uh, this one doesn't sound like that. Which is a shame because the actual native sound of two 136 kilowatt motors in unison pulling away is a really nice sound. And it's been replaced by It, there's no there's no hint of an internal combustion engine sound either, which is a weird choice because this car originally had a massive what V8 under the hood. Yeah, and it, again, when we think about who this vehicle is intended to be purchased by, you would really feel like they would go for something that feels more traditional. But instead, no, no, and it's actually a noise that's so unpleasant that Erin, when she was driving our filming vehicle ahead of us earlier, was like, what? What's that noise? She radioed to us and went, something's wrong. Is, is, is there something wrong with the car? And it's like, no, no, it's, it's meant to do that. It is just the weirdest sound. It really is. And, you know, it almost feels like like Genesis kind of went, oh, we've got to make it sound different. Make it sound different, but not alien. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's interesting. A lot of the noises this car makes are actually very pleasant, if somewhat airliner-y. It does chime in a way that makes me feel like I need to put my tray table up and make sure the seat back is in an upright position. And be ready for the captain's announcement. Yeah, but that particular noise is distinct from the rest of the Hyundai Kia Genesis eGMP cars from which so many bits have been borrowed. And not in a way that I would have chosen. That's a fair assessment. That really is a fair assessment. We've talked about a lot We've talked a lot about the interior of this car. What we haven't really talked about a lot is what the driver feedback is. And this very much has the drive-by-wire disconnected feeling. There's not a lot that makes me go, oh yeah, I know exactly where the steering wheel is and where the wheels are and everything else. The one pedal driving, if you're using iPedal, that feels very much like it does in any other Hyundai Kia vehicle. But the steering is not necessarily quick or responsive. No, it definitely lacks feedback. And it's, I think it's reasonably precise. Oh, it's, it's but... very good at low speed. It's got a great turning circle at low speed for something so large. Yeah, but it definitely, again, this harks back to it not being a car for a driver. It's not intended to make you feel that way and it does not definitely not I, it makes you feel like it's it reminds you that you are driving a large vehicle how about that and the more i look over the front of this bonnet the more i'm reminded of that jaguar xj feel yeah i it's got the same almost the same pattern yeah, it does have a very similar kind of dip in the center and that long hood, that definitely makes you feel like you're driving a large-ish performance sedan, which is what they're going for. And this is a performance car in so much as, you know, I know we've talked about it being more of a retiree's car, but it, it shifts. Oh, absolutely. You can chirp the tires. Are we in sport mode? We're not no, in sport no. mode right now. And it also says leading vehicle is driving away. But look, that that moves quick. Yeah, zero to six years under five seconds. Which does put a little smile on your face. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't take much to put a smile on my face. It's just an EV accelerating quickly and making that whoosh noise. Which again, I heard more there than the whiny cat. So the whiny cat is clearly not for me. It's for other people. But I do wonder if there's something to be said for trying to keep some of those sounds at least 
similar. <laughs> well, I, I think the the sound that the EGMP motors make is actually really quite yeah. good. And it is a shame that it gets covered by the mandatory noisemaker, which is not me saying that cars should not make noises, because I do understand the reason that we have mandatory noisemakers. But I'm, I'm not going to go back to harping on about it. But yeah, it's a shame. I, I do like lots about the driving experience, though. And the first one is the head-up display, which sadly does not work if you're wearing polarised sunglasses, as I discovered over the weekend but it gives you all the information you need it's bright and clear it's not confusing to operate although you do have to go into the menu system to set it up but again it comes back to the fact that this is a car that's probably only going to be driven by two people it's not a car that multiple people are going to borrow um, there are some cars in the market today that you could imagine the parents driving and then kids or roommates or lodgers or whatever borrowing and driving this is a car that once you've set up how you want it to be it's generally gonna be that way and stay that way i think one of the other things to note from the driver perspective is how good the visibility is oh yeah there's very little in the way of blind spots you just got a little bit there at the rear but actually, this is better visibility than a lot of hatchbacks, and that's rare for a sedan. It is. I really like the visibility out of that rear quarter. It's very good. The screen pillars I found are a little large, but that's true of a lot of modern vehicles, and you do get that blind spot from that, but the rest of it is really very good. And this is not the best road. Interior cabin noise is nice and, and low a little bit of noise from the from the seals here but you could have a quiet civilized conversation and drive it in a quiet civilized way this is a car that doesn't egg you on to drive hard this is a car that eggs you on to take your time and uh, i will attest to that by the fact that i am driving below the speed limit right now and there are numerous cars behind me I feel like we need to find a tea shop somewhere. Mm. Maybe a clotted cream scone. Yeah, if only they sold clotted cream in the US. I know of one place in uh, Port Townsend that makes its own clotted cream. And, and then we could go to a lovely art show. Yes, yeah, I do like to have a little it, wander It around. is that kind of car. <laughs> However, I think depending on where you come from and what your background is will influence quite dramatically how you feel about this. My partner, 100% American, did not like this one little bit. I, as a Brit, who spent some time in, in kind of old country, high-end luxury cars, this does remind me of a Jaguar in so many ways. Even this, even the steering wheel reminds me of a uh, again, uh, of the of the XJ. It's sort of a mid nineties y feel. I feel like this whole interior is a mid nineties kind of throwback, with just a little bit of high end technology thrown in. Yeah, and it's not rear wheel drives. So it's not going to misbehave. It's got all wheel drives. So it's going to be nice and sure footed. It does have that nice feature of disconnecting the front motor for efficiency. Which, again, is how it gets the range it does. I believe that we have come to a very good evaluation of who we think this car is for. Is it for me? Heck no. If you are somebody who is a retiree, who doesn't want a fancy high-end Tesla, this is a good alternative and is cheaper than a Model S. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are somebody who is a retiree who enjoys, you know, power kiting at the weekend and 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 has a couple of mountain bikes to strap on the back, this is not going to be for you. No. Maybe a GV60 would be a better choice. A GV60 would be a better choice. And I think this is really interesting because I think Genesis is the only brand that I can think of that is offering two very different electric vehicles targeted at two 
almost diametrically opposed marketplaces. That is a, an interesting point, yes. They, the differentiation between these two vehicles in their range is quite staggering. And I think that's going to be very good for Genesis long term because instead of going after the tech-filled market, it's going after a different market. This is not just another Tech Bros electric vehicle. And I've got to give Genesis kudos for that. We've got way too many Tech Bros. We need some other market segments covered too. Yes. Yeah, and this definitely does that. And I'm smiling. Yay. That's a good sign. Even though it's not for me, it's pleasant enough that I can, I can enjoy time behind the wheel. So there we have it, the Genesis G80 Electrified. What do you think, Kate? Well, I think that for its target market, it might be an interesting option. I think that this is a car that is targeted to a very specific market. And let's be honest, this is a car that is not designed for our age group. No, no, I think it's designed for people coming up to retirement, maybe mid upper end managers who want a vehicle that will take them till they don't need a vehicle anymore. And want a car that can do neat tricks like this. Well, I actually think that's just really a feature of the vehicle being based on many of the components from the EGMP platform. I suspect that many of the purchasers of this vehicle will actually never use most of its functions. Well, this is the thing, right? This is a technology feature, and I'm playing with the key in the, in the pocket here. This technology feature is, is, is very fancy. It allows you to move in and out of a parking space so that you can then easily get in and out of the car. And if you have mobility issues, this is a great idea. But learning how to use this is not particularly easy. I mean, we've had cars with this feature all year and we've been trying to figure out how to do this a lot. And sometimes it works, like it just did. And other times, yeah, it, it doesn't. No, other times it will just sit and ignore you and it's not clear as to why. And that's not very helpful for someone who might not be that comfortable with it. And the whole of this car has been designed to dumb down some of the technology. The interior feels much more like a traditional gasoline vehicle than an electric vehicle. Yes, you've got this lovely touchscreen display in the center. You've got the fairly run-of-the-mill faux analog floating holographic dashboard most of this car is designed to be used by someone who may have never even driven an electric car before but wants to benefit from having a clean green vehicle we are of course dancing around the fact that we both think that this is a car that is aimed at at boomers yes i think it is i mean it's really aimed at people coming up to retirement or maybe who have already retired. Or maybe who have already retired. And that's kind of where it comes to with the question that I asked at the beginning. There are really two main types of luxury electric vehicle. You have the electric vehicle that's designed as a driver's car. A good example of that would be the iX that we drove not so long ago. That is definitely a car that is engineered to be enjoyable to the driver enjoyable to the passengers but mostly it's all about the driving experience the porsche taycan family yes, definitely, definitely a driver's, a driver's car. car mercedes s-class mercedes eqs more towards the passenger than the driver although it is still an excellently driving car and this one doesn't fit into either of those categories we've driven it and found it it is a pleasant vehicle to be in but it's not exciting or inspiring to drive. It is non-offensive. It is. It is a vehicle that you could introduce as a party and it would be there and people would go, oh yeah, yeah, I, I don't remember what we talked about, but it seemed nice enough. And a 
I'm not, we're not knocking this car. I think it's really important to note that we're not knocking this car. We're just trying to figure out where it fits in. So you've got your Model S, high end, high performance, high tech. That's your tech bro car. The people who made thousands of dollars investing in Bitcoin or Elon Musk or whatever. That is their car. The Mercedes EQS is mm. the car that you buy if you're not going to bulk at the incredibly high sticker price and you've got a Mercedes-Benz dealer on speed dial and maybe you live out in the country so you need that that four-wheel steering to get round your tiny mountain roads. This is an urbanites car or a suburbanites car. It's take the grandkids out at the weekend for an ice cream, take them to the, the picture house. It's a car that you're going to be comfortable enough in on short distance trips. Maybe that's why they've got that very basic charging cable in the boot because they don't expect you to do lots of trips away from home. This sits on your driveway, it looks nice, it's very refined, very quiet. If you need to make an emergency maneuver and get out of trouble, it will do it. It reminds me, you know, it really reminds me of a combination of the old Jaguar XJ, that kind of wall of word and opulence, mixed with 1980s, 1990s American land yachts, your Cadillacs. Yeah your yeah, Lincolns. Yeah. It's got that same kind of feel to it. It does. And I think that while it isn't for us, if they were to sell it in more than a compliance way, I can actually see it being quite popular with a certain group of people. And it doesn't have the silly orb. I mean, the mighty orb. It does not have the mighty orb of power. But you don't need the mighty orb of power in this car because you've already arrived. That is it for today's video. If you liked our review of this fun car, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to leave your thoughts below or in our free to join Discord chat room. There are links in the video description. And if you really liked this video, why not leave us a super thanks? It is easy to do and everything you do send goes towards helping us make great content. If you haven't already, please make sure that you have subscribed to this channel and to our other channel, Transport Evolve Take Two, and give the bell a gentle ding to be told when our next video goes live. Thanks again to Owls here for letting us film at their wonderful garden center. Check it out if you are in the area in Tigard here in Oregon. And before I go, do check out our regular sponsors, links below. And if you use any of those links, you will be helping us out because in using those codes, you will end up sending some money towards us. Thanks on behalf of the entire team, go out to everyone who makes this channel possible. That includes those of you who support us on Patreon and YouTube, as well as those of you who just watch and share the videos. If you're a supporter at the charged up level, you'll see your name right here on my right. And if you just joined, we're sorry if your name isn't showing just yet. We currently render the list out every week or so, but sometimes our videos are produced a few weeks in advance. Thanks to our self-driving tier supporters, Mike Weeder, Patrick Boyarski, Chris Maxwell, Brian Newton, Michael Goad, Bennett Elder, Andrew Martin, Pedro Mura Pinheiro, Profi Wolf, Chris and Michael Johnson, Tesla in the Gong, Dan Blair, Peter Dillinger, Gordon C., Stephen O'Donoghue, Kyle Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Raging Fellows, Denny Hyde, Chris Center, and Jim Burness. And of course, out of this world, thanks to our Starman supporters, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, JP Fagerback, Joe Bresney, John Lyons, Rory Litwin, Kevin Burrowbridge, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Paul Conway, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and Ian. Ian? Just Ian? Just No Ian. mister, no last name, just Ian. We checked. No, it's just Ian. If you would like to join that amazing list, you can do so by following the link below. 
that will take you to either Patreon or to our YouTube sign up page. You can also send us money using Bitcoin, Kofi, or by buying something from our cool swag store. The car is making weird noises. <laughs> and if you can't support us financially just know that watching the channel and interacting with it and taking part in our discord chat really makes a massive difference to how well our various videos perform and interact with us on social media i know there's been a big change lately with the flood of people away from twitter but we're still there in various other social media groups so follow the links below we're not on twitter anymore but we are in other places thanks for watching us and as always Keep, Keep evolving! evolving.